My name is Lisa. I'm one of the pastors here. Happy to be able to, to share what I believe God's laid on my heart lately. The message for today is titled, Walking in Expectation. Walking in Expectation. Psalm 5.3 states, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you, and I wait in expectation. I think what the psalmist is getting at here is someone who has um, this expectation, this awareness that God is always at work, that God is always at work and we can anticipate his goodness, that each day is full of possibilities. Is that you? Are you someone that lives in expectation? Do you consider yourself someone who waits and looks and seeks the goodness of God? Or maybe if you're honest, you've become too buried with disappointment or too uh, bored with the ordinary to expect anything good anymore. My guess is that uh, we're kind of all somewhere in between. Well, we're going to look at a passage today, a poem, if you, will, if you will, that paints a compelling picture of what it looks like to walk in expectation. The psalmist likens the journey of God's people to a pilgrimage. Now, since that's not a word I often use, I've looked it up and found these descriptions for us. Okay, I was just checking to make sure that our screen was working. Whoops, we're going to go back. <laughs> um, looked up some descriptions to see what pilgrimage means. First one I found was this, pilgrimage, a pilgrim's journey. <laughs> Not quite helpful. Pilgrimage, a journey to some sacred place as an act of religious devotion. A pilgrim is more than a tourist and a pilgrimage is more than a journey. A pilgrim travels with a spiritual purpose, a goal to be closer to God. Here's another one, pilgrimage. A journey often into an unknown or foreign place where a person goes in search of new or expanded meaning of their self, others, nature, or a higher good through the experience. It can lead to personal transformation after which the pilgrim usually returns to regular life. Now, after a quick search online, I was floored to discover how many options there were for pilgrimages that were offered all over the world. And what was fascinating to me is that this is something that's universally attractive. No matter uh, what age, what race, what ethnicity, what background, what capabilities, what beliefs, what religions, you name it, there is something in the human soul that is just hardwired for personal and spiritual discovery. A person who goes on a pilgrimage is someone who is seeking something. Someone who is looking, someone is waiting and anticipating. In other words, there's someone who walks in expectation. Now, one of the most famous pilgrimages in the world today, and maybe you guys know this, is the El Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James. I have a, uh, a picture here. Of, so it is, here is Spain, this region right here, this is Portugal, and then France is right up there. And there's a little uh, like star right here uh, that's red in the region. And that is the destination of people who take this pilgrimage. And where are they going or what are they wanting to see? Well, uh, it's this cathedral and supposedly the relics of, of the Apostle James is in this place. And so for over a thousand years, can you believe that? Over a thousand years, people have been making this journey, this pilgrimage. And they start from all different regions, um, different countries. Now, the most famous one is called the French Way. People start down here at southern France, and they follow this journey along the way. And that's about 484 miles that people take. A few pictures of what this looks like. Um, this is the French Way. So that's beautiful, right? Don't you want to kind of just put a backpack on and head out? Um, 
Here's another journey, and you'll notice this is a sign that has a shell on it, and that is, a, a, that is like the symbol that you're on the right track, that you're on the trail, is this shell. And many times to distinguish if it's a tourist versus a pilgrim is people are wearing that shell. Here's another beautiful picture of kind of more of an aerial view of that. So I was curious, okay, how many people have done this last year? And I looked on the, the main website for it, and 400, about 438,000 people completed this pilgrimage last year alone. And when you, when you complete it, you get the certification of completion, which is kind of cool, and they call it a compostelas, a compostelas. So people are wired for pilgrimage. And uh, when, the, when many of the people took this uh, journey, most people walked, but you know what? Some people, um, they biked. Some sailed, I don't know how that worked. <laughs> Some even passed, passed through on wheelchairs. But no matter how, um, how they chose to do it, how they chose to, to make the travel, they approached it with expectation. And I think they approached it of just desiring to say, hey, I wanna learn something new. Maybe in this journey I wanna discover something about myself. Maybe they just wanted you know, to take in the sights of the beauty around them, but there was something as they ventured out and as they made their way towards that cathedral, towards that place of St. James that they wanted to uh, learn or discover. So this idea of pilgrimage is a lot like life, isn't it? Well, now that we are kind of in that mindset, I wanna draw our attention to that poem, to that metaphor in Psalms that I was talking to you about. So we're gonna be in Psalms 84 today. And if you have your Bible or your device, I uh, invite you to turn there with me. And we're just going to kind of go verse by verse, and it's really short, but it's packed full, so we're going to go slow. Uh, turn to Psalm 84, and we're going to start in verse 5. Now, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context, though, before I start reading. So the psalmist uh, most likely is a psalmist that, that used to be working as a doorkeeper in the temple of God. And so the, the place of worship, the place in Jerusalem where the temple was, was a place that was very dear to him. But he's writing this psalm most likely in exile. And he's writing in exile. Now, remember, this is the period of time in Israel's history when Jerusalem was overtaken and Jewish people will, were forcefully uh, thrown out and taken to Babylon, far, far, far away from their homeland. So this psalmist is writing it in a place of exile. He's writing it in a place without his place of worship um, as a foreigner far from home, and he misses the temple. So you can hear the longing in his voice if you begin reading in Psalm 84, and some of you recognize this. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns for you, faints for you in the courts of God. Here's another line. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. You remember this. We sang this in the 90s. And we repeated that phrase a million times. <laughs> but it stuck, didn't it? So that's the psalm we're talking about. And he is longing uh, to be in a place with God in his presence. With that in context, let's start reading in verse 5. He writes, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. It starts with the word blessed. Whenever you see the word blessed, kind of lean in and pay attention because blessed can be translated happy. I like happy, so tell me more. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you. Strength in, in the Lord is something I think we sometimes just throw around, but have we taken time to really unpack and see what it means? And it's used in Psalms um, alone 44 times, the specific word strength. Someone who is strong in the Lord is someone who is, whose identity is founded in him. Someone who says, in the Lord, that is the essence of who I am. It's someone who is utterly dependent on God to sustain them. He is their lifeline. He is the source of everything good. Someone who is strong in the Lord is someone who is able to kind of stay grounded, stay firm, no matter what comes their way. 
Temptation comes, they stay firm. Opposition, struggle, they stay firm. The world could be crumbling around them or they could be raised to stardom and it doesn't matter, they're steady because they're strong in the Lord. Next we read, they're not only strong in the Lord, but it says, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Notice hearts are, that's plural. So this isn't a journey that someone is doing by themselves. This isn't a solo adventure. This isn't a solo pilgrimage. It is something that they are doing together. And this phrase, hearts are set, means this person is filled with resolve, with determination. They're saying, I'm not budging. Have you ever had your heart set on something? Now, I'm not talking about like, I have my heart set on fitting into my jeans, finally, my favorite jeans, or I have my, my heart set and give my driver's license. Any teenagers in here? That's a big day, but I'm not talking about that or taking that vacation. Or here's one, parents, your heart set on your growing children finally moving out of the basement. <laughs> or how about ripping out that really ugly wallpaper in the bathroom, you know, like you got to get it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something much deeper, something um, that comes from within, like this dream, this longing. It could be a goal of yours. You're saying, no matter what, I commit to this. I think Olympians, they have that, that kind of resolve, that resilience. I had a roommate who trained to be an Olympian. I watched her 12 years train. She was a diver. Phenomenal. Didn't quite get there, but made trials. I watched her have her heart set on something. Another picture as I have of, a, of a, a, a father holding his new baby girl in his hands and looking at the awe and wonder of this precious baby and something fierce and protective wells up and he's like, I'm never letting you out of the house. <laughs> My heart is set on committing to protect you and love you with everything that's in me. Heart set in, in inner resilience a decision, something that arises out of that deep place. So who we are informs everything about how we approach this pilgrimage. Blessed are the ones whose strength is in the Lord and whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. We've talked about pilgrimage, spiritual journey. You may be wondering, where is this person heading? Well, you'll find out at the end, verse 7, he's saying, whose hearts are set. He is headed towards Zion, the holy city. He's headed towards Jerusalem. That's his desired destination. That's where he wants to end up. And pilgrimages, they're not like, it's not like you're a tourist. You can't approach life like you're a tourist, seeking pleasure, just wanting beauty and new knowledge. No, this is something, this is an inner journey. And the psalmist is drawing our attention to that. We see here he's painting a picture of the type of people who do well. Who do well. Everything, it has everything to do with who you are. Now, now don't miss this. He is saying the, travels, the travelers who are the happiest, the ones who are blessed, on their pilgrimage are the ones who are anchored in God and the ones who are resilient in reaching their destination. So be that person. And as far as it depends on you, get this, choose your fellow travelers wisely. Let me ask you this. If you had to walk the El Santiago de Camino, who would you want to go with you? You're going to be very choosy about who you choose to be by your side. All the more, when you're choosing who to do life with, who are the people you're going to travel with, it matters who you choose. Choose the people whose strength is in the Lord and whose hearts are set and keep them close. Now that we have a picture of the kind of people who are embarking on this pilgrimage, he says um, he, he's going to move into a place of saying, hey, I know something about the common experience that's inevitable, and it's something that none of us really want to um, approach or encounter, but it's just part of the journey. And he begins in verse 6. He says, as they pass through the valley of Baca. 
as they pass through the Valley of Baca. What is the Valley of Baca? The Valley of Baca, Baca can be translated the place of tears, the place of weeping. The valley could be metaphor here, or it could actually be a real place. But depending on where you start the journey, not all people pass through a specific valley, which makes me think it's more of a metaphor. It's a place that's unwanted. It's a place that nobody wants to have to face. It also can be translated in, in terms of like a dry or arid valley. Baca um, also means the balsam tree. And what I learned that's really fascinating about the balsam tree is it has a resin that is emitted and it's a, a balm, a balm that is a healing agent. So picture that passing through a valley where the trees emit something that is of healing to the people around them. Quick word about the valley. I'm not talking about a valley that could just, you know, be a extreme crisis or a valley that is marked by a colossal failure. Failure, no. Valleys can be anything that discourage you, that numb you, that hold you back from moving forward in the journey. It's basically anything that's unwanted, a place that just feels dry, or it could be a place of weeping. Maybe you're disconnected from relationships. Maybe your soul is weary from unanswered prayer. Maybe you're feeling unfulfilled at work, spiritual apathy, lack of inspiration, compassion fatigue. And these kinds of valleys, they come to all of us at one time or another. Some of you listening today may say, Lisa, I've been in a valley for a really, really long time. Well, pay attention to what he says next. It's like, is it going to be good news or bad news? Uh, this line, as they pass through, as they pass through. So it's this idea that you're not going to stay there forever. You pass through, even though it's unexpected, even though it's not wanted, you can't avoid it, you can't go around it, you can't go over it or under it, you have to go through it. You have to go through it. And I love this, this message of just saying, hey, a pilgrim of God passes through. Some of you need to really hold on to that simple truth today. You will pass through. Moving on, he says, and this is where the good news comes, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains cover it with pools. So as you're walking through this unwanted valley, he writes, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Well, what does it mean they make it a place of springs? One translation said they dug wells. You look around, place is dry. What are we going to have to do? I guess we got to dig a well. But he's, he's showing us that the people of God, when they enter unwanted places, they have the power through God to transform it and make it a place of refreshing, make it a place that is nourishing potential for life. He is saying you have agency and you have power even in those places you don't want to make it a place where the spirit of God dwells. You can influence your environment even in the midst of heartache. The picture gets better. He says the autumn rains cover it with pools. Autumn rains are the early rains. What did the early rains do in dry places? The early rains is what softened the soil and made it more uh, able for, for growth of life and plants. The early rains soften the soil. And the rains are different from these springs. The rains come from heaven. The rains are what God sends. Digging the wells was kind of agency of the traveler, right? The rains come from God, so it's kind of two-part. And I love this, this thought of rains falling from heaven and saying, God hasn't forgotten about you. And these pools can be translated blessing. So the blessing of God falls in the valley. And that's something that you can expect. 
So in summary, despite encountering unwanted conditions on this pilgrimage, which they will, the people of God can expect two things. One, their collective presence will bring refreshment. Okay, make it a place of springs. God will pour out his blessings. The rains will cover it with pools. Now notice in this poem, he's not saying how God's going to do that necessarily specifically. We would love that. That would be nice. He is just describing how God acts and how the people of God act as they pass through. Well, now I'm curious, well, how does this end? Verse 7, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Simply, the people just keep getting stronger. They just keep getting stronger and they finish well. The, the valley didn't, didn't uh, you know, deter them. It didn't stop them. They didn't quit. They continued and they finished in a place of strength in the Lord. It says, they go collectively together, strength to strength. When one was weak, the other was strong. And together they were able to finish it. And I love this, till each appears before God in Zion. What is he talking about? Till... Uh, in this poem, it's their journey to the holy city in Jerusalem, the place where they finally can experience the presence of God in the temple. That was their final destination. And I just find this as a compelling vision for what dry valleys or what va um, valleys of weeping can become when our strength is in the Lord and our hearts are set on a pilgrimage. Because as followers of Jesus... <laughs> We are on a similar pilgrimage ourselves. About a month ago, I was, I was having my time with God in the morning, and I was having one of those desperate mornings. Have you ever had one of these mornings where you just say, I don't want to do today. I really don't want to do today. Of course, you've had those mornings. Maybe today was a morning, and I'm glad you're here. But I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I said, oh, God, I need something. And I looked over, and I saw my Bible, and it was kind of one of those half-hearted, reluctant, oh, God, could you do it for me again today? Is there something maybe in there that you could have for me today? And I just said, oh, God, I need a word today. Well, I picked it up. I opened the pages, and my eyes fell on other, none other than Psalm 84 specifically these verses of five through seven. Now, have you ever read something and it just kind of lit you up inside from Scripture? And you might have written, you, you might have, you know, even studied it before. And all of a sudden you're like, I've never read this before. Wow. It's like you read it for the first time. And that happened to me and it captured me. The imagery and the hope-filled message. And I went from a place of feeling like unmotivated, sad, overwhelmed to a place of excited, strengthened, and hopeful. That's God and that's what he wants to do. And you know, over the last several weeks, I haven't been able to like move away from it. I have sat with it, studied it, rehearsed it in my mind. And the more that I've, I've done that, the more that I've sensed that this wasn't just a word for me, but it was a word for our church as well. See, come away, I see these verses, I see this picture as, as an image of what we're becoming as a church. This poem, this metaphor in part describes how I see God forming us as a people, as disciples of Jesus. People who are learning how to be with him, to be like him, to do what Jesus did. We have been on a journey of deepening our spiritual roots through, through uh, various practices. We have become more connected as a community through group life and service and family events and telling our stories to one another. We have courageously plunged the depths of our hearts, whether we wanted to or not, and we've grown in self-awareness. We've done it with courage. We've pursued healing. We've allowed the grace of God to free us in places we've been held captive for so long. And God's making us whole. And we've been doing this journey together. All of these things, all of these things have helped us be what? Strong in the Lord. They've helped us be able to learn how to set our hearts on a journey, on a pilgrimage towards God. And by God's grace, we're going to continue to move forward. We're going to continue 
to move forward even as we pass through our own valleys of Baca. But here's something new that I'm believing God for in our midst. Here's something new, and it comes from verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, what? They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. I'm believing, God, that we will become more of a people who walk in expectation by watering the world around us and looking for the rain. And this is a posture of living. It's a way of life. It's not, it's, it's not loud. It's not flashy. It's more, of a, it's more of a kind of a quiet trust of paying attention, of being fully present to God and living out of a soul that's at rest, a soul that believes in the goodness and love of a father. And I'm wondering, can we become more of a people whose thoughts and actions and habits communicate in anticipation of a greater experience of the kingdom of God. So that even as we pass through the valleys, we can trust that the spirit of God living in us would bring refreshment to a dry and weeping world around us, to a dry and weeping city around us, that the goodness of God would continue to rain down even in the most difficult and unwanted situations. Because that's who God is. He's a life-giving God. He's a God who is good and who is loving. Now, how he chooses to demonstrate that again, I don't know. He's such a mystery. His ways are not our ways, but together we can pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I enjoyed looking over some Old Testament prophecies this week that painted pictures of what it looks like for the kingdom of God to come. Some of you might recognize this. Streams in the desert. Beauty for ashes, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, tables of abundance for the hungry, dancing instead of weeping, blossoms in the wilderness, victory instead of defeat, freedom from captivity, sight to the blind, a heart of flesh for a heart of stone, sounds of joy instead of desolation, cities built out of ruins, and the list could go on. We serve a God of restoration, a God who brings order out of chaos, who relishes in bringing about redemption in the middle of our messes. When you are in the Lord, no matter how weak you are or how weak you feel, no matter how bleak the path looks, God will sustain you and he will hold you. And remember, this isn't a journey that we do alone. It's something we do together. One of my favorite prayers um, that I have heard prayed in the last uh, few weeks was from our youth pastor, Tyler. And one morning in a prayer time before church, he said, and God, just can you make it so all our bad days are not on the same day? <laughs> and he was talking about our staff team, and I said, amen to that. May all, may all our bad days not just be on the same day. And you know, we've had some bad days in the last month. We've had some days that have been difficult to navigate. When we received uh, news about Matt's diagnosis, can I go there briefly with you? That was a heartbreaking day for us. And in my grief, I was inadequate and didn't know how to best support and comfort my staff team around me. I was sitting in my office with Jeremy, we're just kind of reeling, and, and Tyler, speaking of which, came by again. He kind of poked his, his head, and he's like, guys, I'm, I'm out for the day. We're like, okay, see ya. And he left, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, like a vision of his face that said, I'm sad, and I need you guys too. And I realized here, I was in my office with, some, with Jeremy, and Tyler was alone in, his, in another room in the church. And all of a sudden, I came to it, and I'm like, oh, my. And so I dashed out of my office. I ran down the hallway. I burst out of the back door, caught him before he got in his car, yelled across the parking lot, Tyler, I'm sorry. I don't know how to do this. And he looks at me, and he yells back, me neither. <laughs> so he walks back to me. We give each other a hug, and... Through my tears, I said, but we're going to do this together. We're going to do this together. 
And that is so crucial to passing through the valleys and learning to walk in expectation because life throws all kinds of stuff at us and there's no manual for it. And we just have to learn to look at each other and say, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do this, but we can do it together. A few weeks ago, I was at the Kamaway Women's Retreat. Great time, by the way. And uh, there were a few moments where I just stopped and I looked around at, at, at all these women. There was a little over about 30, and I thought to myself, what an incredible group of women. What, what beautiful people, and this is a church I get to be a part of, and I was so grateful. This is a really special place. And at this moment, as a church, we have a chance to journey this together for this time as we head towards our eternal home. I'm comforted by the words of the psalmist that close. He says, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Translated, we will walk this path together. We will walk it strong together in the Lord and we will finish strong together until the day comes where we meet Jesus face to face. And that's what we have to look forward to. A day when our hearts are finally home. So in the meantime... Let's approach life as a pilgrimage. Let's walk in expectation that God is at work and we're anticipating he's working and he's good. How can we believe that God's working? The love of God promises you that. So let's join him. I'd like to close us in a time of, of prayer with you. And I, I'd like you to take a moment as you're sitting there and just try to identify, maybe you already have as you've been sitting there, a valley of Baca in your own life. A place that's unwanted. Maybe it's a place of tears. Maybe it's a dry place. Or maybe you're in a really good season on this journey, and I love that. But maybe you know someone who's going through a valley, and so maybe this time is holding that person before the Lord. But I want you to think about that place and identify it. What is it for you? I have a few prayers I want us to uh, offer to Jesus in that space. And the first one is this. Jesus, how can you help me make this a place of springs? Whatever it is that you're holding right now in the presence of Jesus, can you ask him, Jesus, how can you help me make this a place of springs? Some ideas. Choose love. Choose sacrifice. Choose generosity. Accept help. Find ways to add value in the spaces that you occupy. Show up honestly and humbly. Point people to the awe and wonder of an ordinary day. Laugh, celebrate, forgive, and forgive again. Maybe it's a question you can continue to, to bring to God this week. The second question I have for us is, Jesus, help me look for the rain. Help me look for the rain that you're going to send that nourishes the ground, that brings pools of refreshment, that brings blessing to the area that's surrounding me. And folks, one of the best ways that we can be attentive to look for this rain and recognize it, I, usually, I like to say, it's rain if it looks like Jesus, <laughs> if it embodies who he is and what he's about. And you primarily do this through staying connected with God through prayer, listening, talking, um, seeking him, praying with others. Asking God to sharpen your awareness and your spiritual senses. Knowing him more deeply through scripture. And you know one of the biggest blessings God might rain down to you in this time? It might be the traveler next to you. And you hold on to them. And they will be the ones that believe for you. And they will be your pool of blessing. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, that you would make us people that walk in expectation. 
that we would become more and more of a church that out of our strength in you and out of our hearts set on this pilgrimage, God, that you would help us to be able to see how we can uh, bring nourishment, how we can make even unwanted places, places of springs to the world around us. We've got a hurting city and we have hurting people in our midst. Would you make us more into those people? And God, would you help us to uh, be able to be more aware of your activity and, and the blessings that you send? May we not miss them, even if they're in disguise. Help us look for it, anticipate, believe you for it, and understand that you are good. I pray that over each person today. In your precious name, I pray, amen. I'd like to leave you with a benediction today. So if you'd stand. I encourage you um, to open your hands in, re in receiving if you feel comfortable with that. And I just want to recite this passage over you today. Blessed are you, Commonway Church, whose strength is in the Lord whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. As you pass through your dry valleys or your valley of weeping, may the Spirit of God empower you to make it a place of springs to the world around you. And may you lift your head and look towards heaven for the rain for the blessings that God wants to send that will cover your valley with pools. And you will go from strength to strength till we, we each appear before God in Zion. Amen. Walk in the expectation of God today. Be blessed.